Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Eczema Podcast. It is so great to have all of you tune in today. I have an amazing guest on the show today. He's actually a naturopath um, that I have on my team. And I really love his approach because he takes such a um, holistic and functional approach as well. He's seen and worked with many of our clients from babies to adults. So he's very skilled in all ages. And I just love that he really takes an investigative deep dive. He looks at everything from um, functional tests that you can do to assess what's happening in the body, all the way uh, to looking at symptoms that um, you experience, and also doing um, things topically to help as well. And he has personally experienced eczema and topical steroid withdrawal himself. So he is also incredibly empathetic, and he understands what it's like to go through it. If you are currently suffering from eczema, we're talking today about how to support your detox pathways, how to reduce stress, and how to help babies and adults and children who are who are suffering from eczema flares. So welcome, Ben. It's great to have you on the show today. Thanks, Abby. And maybe I'll first um, introduce myself. Um, so I'm Ben, and I'm from Singapore. Um, my journey to become a naturopath was inspired by my own eczema and TSW journey. Um, since young, I've had like severe full body flare ups and because of that, it led me to, um, to leave my career as a corporate, um, in a corporate job and then to do naturopathy. And I have, um, I'm qualified as a naturopath and I finished my four year full time on site course in naturopathy. And I think it's a blessing to help people and it's so fulfilling to live a life when your where your beliefs, values, and actions align every single day. Yeah, and it's amazing because um he has also personally helped myself and my son as well, and my baby. So um he's definitely well versed and and able to work with different ages and help you see um, what's what's causing your potential flares as well. So today we are working on detox pathways. Uh, if one area of your detox pathway is clogged, it can potentially affect the rest of your skin. It can cause flares, congestion, um, and it can cause other symptoms in the body as well. So Ben, I'm going to let you share today. And he's really great with um, just sharing uh, even on... Um, uh, we, we're going to show a whiteboard if you're watching the video version so he can show some diagrams as well. So, Ben, I'll let you lead today. Um, let me know where you want to start because I know that talking about eczema is there's so many ways that we can tackle this. And I want to make sure that we're helping our viewers as well. Sure. So thanks, Abby. I think maybe before we start to discuss detox pathways, um, let me first preface the eczema treatment using our naturopathic philosophy. And so in naturopathy, we always think of it as a triangle. And so let me just draw this for you because I love to draw on the whiteboards and to just um, illustrate these points. So do you guys see my whiteboard pop up uh, in front of you? Great, you see a triangle there. So um, in almost every treatment that, that we do, um, in my mind, we always make sure that the foundations of the triangle, the base of the triangle is addressed first before we move on to other parts of the triangle. So the base is always diet, stress management, and this is major. Um, and then before we go up the triangle, the next part then is the detox pathways. And there is a hierarchy and, and order to this. Um, beyond the detox pathways, we'll support the organ strengthening. And then beyond these, we then look at symptomatic natural support. <clears throat> and finally, um, I wish to also just share at this juncture that um, we often, I often see naturopathic medicine and Western medicine in a continuum because there is a place and a time for Western medicine for antibiotics um, and even biologics if the cases are severe. So going up the triangle, we have allopathics, allopathic medicine. So um, this is just a preface to 
today's talk, and I wish to just zoom into one part, which is the detox pathways, but keep in mind that we always see the body holistically, and therefore we shouldn't forget that there are other parts of the triangle, but this, this will be a different talk for a different day. But today, let's discuss the detox pathways. And if um, anyone is joining in, um, just ask any questions and, um, and I'll respond to them uh, when I can. Um, now, let me just delete the screen. Okay, on detox pathways, um, the first thing I often notice in my practice is that people do it the other way around or the reverse way around. What I mean is that think of your pathways like a river, okay? So your river is flowing this way and it bifurcates into two parts generally, okay? So my joints are the best, but I apologize for my poor art. Um, so the always start from the end. Remember this, in detox pathways, always begin from the last pathway first before you open up the earlier pathways. So the two last pathways are your poo, your bowels, and your pee, the kidneys. Let me just draw this here. Where's my sticky notes? Yeah, okay, there it is. So um, the pee or the kidneys. And these are the two last pathways. So I often see that people get flare-ups when they don't address these. So if you're constipated or if you're dehydrated, if your water intake is insufficient, do not do, not do any gut killing or liver work before you open up the last two pathways. So let me populate the pathways before this. You have your liver here. And before the liver, you then have the, the lymphatics and often the gut, gut and lymphatics. They have them before. So having this in mind, <clears throat> we, I always see in practice that people will say, oh, did they read that this certain antimicrobial supplement is great? And they take it and they kill parasites, they kill bacteria, they kill yeast and they get a flare up in a few days, or they may feel well, they may feel great for one or two days and they get a major flare up. Why is it so? If you see the river that is flowing, the water jams up here, right? Because as we push down the, the water flow, going downwards, we jam up this area here. If you are not pooping every day, and if you're dehydrated, and if you're not peeing every day. Um, maybe at this juncture, we, we just we should ask, um, Abby, is it all clear so far? And um, has anyone joined in? If, if there's any questions that I can um, address? I think this is clear. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to leave it in the comments and um, we can help you answer them. But this is good so far. Sounds good. So um, let's first talk about the bowels first. And then I'll discuss the kidneys, the liver, and the lymphatics in that order because detox pathways should always be addressed in the reverse order which they come. Um, so let's discuss the bowels. Um, I recall that there was this case that I treated. This girl, she was 13 years old and um, she had this eczema patch on her legs and just wouldn't clear despite all the, um, the gut work, all the liver work. And we just did one thing. We just did um, a fiber supplement and within a week, it cleared up. It never came back since. Because once she began pooping every day, her eczema just disappeared. So um, I wish to also share that having bowel motions, it may seem quite simple, or just increase fiber, increase water intake. However, um, in clinical practice, we see that there are many causes of um, constipation. And let me share this with you. Um, let me bring up the screen. So, for I'll attach the causes into this um, river here and let's talk them through. In constipation, insufficient fiber, which is we all know this, insufficient water, we all know this. However, you'd be surprised that these two reasons are not the most common reasons I see in practice. I commonly see stress. And when there's a stress response, many people I see whole stress in the gut. And your gut is actually a muscle, right? You know, the intestines are muscles. And therefore, if you have a hypertonic state, if it's too tight, 
you hold stress in your muscles and so um, stress is a major part and this is what, what, what we call hypertonic um, a hypertonic constipation state also you have SIBO small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and this SIBO is more than methane dominant SIBO because methane SIBO leads to constipation and so in this case here when patients come in and they have tried fiber water stress management um, and the gut is still not moving i assess through a SIBO breath test or i do a gi map or cdsa and we commonly find high levels of methanogens which means bacteria that produce methane gas and methane impairs the what you call the migrating motor complex the mmc and therefore the stools can't go down very efficiently um, and also sometimes we see candida yeast fungal overgrowth and parasites that can also cause um, constipation. Oh, lastly, and not, not to forget this bowel flow. And bowel is so important. Let me add this, this bowel flow here. And remember that bowel is a nice slippery substance that lubricates your intestines. And therefore, if your bowel isn't flowing well, you can't digest fats, so you have dry skin and your constipation. So bowel flow is so important. Um, now, let me just now move on to some very quick interventions to support bowel motions. Um, and I just wish to caveat that these are not uh, prescriptive and please see your naturopath or your healthcare professional for this, but this is just broad advice to support you in your journey. Um, from the naturopathic angle, fiber. Let's talk fiber first. Um, among all the fiber supplements, the best research that I see is in kiwi fruit and dragon fruit. There's strong research of having two kiwi fruit a day in helping constipation. And the research has been done in IBS-C, IBS constipation subtype. Um, dragon fruit, having half a day or one a day, it's incredibly helpful in giving you the prebiotics to support um, the bowel motion. So it's, it's a prebiotic, it's also a fiber, a rich, a fiber rich fruit. Um, besides these, Let's talk stress management. This is a major, major part in my clinical practice, stress management. And in today's day and age where it's all rush, 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 we are all stressed today. Um, and it's a major, major part in my practice on to use herbs and supplements to support stress resilience. Um, I will talk about, about stress a bit more later, but to just give you a quick overview, um, what I find useful in my practice to reduce this hypertonic state where we hold stress in our gut, the herbs I find useful, valerian, crambuck, chamomile. Valerian, crambuck, chamomile. And um, while we can find th these herbs online on iHerb and so on, however, um, if you see a natural path, we can prescribe to you what I call the um, a more concentrated form of supplements or herbs, which is called a one-to-one -one herbal blend. A one-to-one -one is much more stronger than a one-to-five or one-to-ten that you find online. Um, that said, um, I find that a simple chamomile tea is so useful to just reduce the hypertonic state in constipation. Um, let's discuss SIBO now. This is a major topic and I could discuss this for the next three days nonstop. It's, a, it's huge, but to just give you a one minute overview of SIBO, um, do a SIBO breath test first, test for lactulose and also glucose because these um, simple sugars ferment in different parts of the small intestine. Once we have a SIBO diagnosis, we know whether it's methane dominant or hydrogen dominant or mix. And then we treat it with specific herbs or supplements. And remember that different herbs are for different bacteria. So therefore, um, whether we use neem or pomegranate or sweet wormwood, Chinese wormwood, garlic, these depend on whether you are methane dominant or hydrogen dominant. Um, and also not forgetting the SIBO diet, uh, which is a bit restrictive, but it's very helpful for the short-term management. Now, let me discuss bowel, major topic for bowel, because many of us, we, we've, I find in my practice, many of my, my patients, they have insufficient bowel flow. Now, um, 
bowel, we need a few nutrients. We need taurine for bowel, and taurine is so important for bowel flow. Um, and also, I use herbs. The, my top herb for bowel is globe artichoke, Sanara scolomus. Artichoke has a few benefits. It's not just what we call a cholagog and choleratic. A cholagog means that it helps the bowel flow. A choleratic means that it helps the bowel production. So it produces bowel for you. It also makes your bowel flow better. Number two, globe artichoke is also what we call a depurative or an alterative. As the name suggests, it alters the nature of your blood. And alteratives are what we call blood cleansers in Western herbal medicine. So it supports eczema, it supports bowel flow, supports constipation, supports fat digestion, and it is my favorite herb for skin, globe artichoke. That's great. Um, ben, I wanted to also backtrack a bit and ask what some of the signs and symptoms are if someone has a lack of bile flow and why that can lead to flares as well. Yeah, it's a great question. So bile is a natural antimicrobial. And um, the research is done more in psoriasis, but in psoriasis, they found that giving people bile supplements actually improves psoriasis majorly. And so some signs you can see when you have insufficient bowel is, first and foremost, I always ask my patients, do your stools float on, on, in, your, in your, your toilet bowl? If you poo and you see floating stools, that's one sign that there, is, is, there, is, um, there are bowel issues or that your bowel is coming out too much because bowel floats. Um, the fat, sorry, let me rephrase it. So if you see floating stools, it means that your fats there's fat in the stool, there's steatorrhea. And then fat floats on top of water. And therefore, it means that there is insufficient bowel to emulsify the fats in the stools. That's number one. The other thing I commonly see is that um, you will see that your stools are yellowish. And that means that there's fat malabsorption, or it suggests fat malabsorption. Um, number three, you commonly see dry skin, flaky skin. And these are the three major signs of um, insufficient bowel and therefore causing fat in the stools. Thanks for sharing that. And just for everyone listening, just to give some background, what this means for you is that if, for example, we've always heard that taking omega-3s are really good for your skin, um, fish oil, cod liver oil, hemp oil. So if you, or even coconut oil, so if you are ingesting any type of oil or fats and you actually find that it's causing your skin to flare rather than helping to nourish your skin, um, this can be one reason why, because of a lack of bile. So even though a lot of people mention that fats are good for your skin, but it's not true for everyone, especially for those who are suffering from eczema and if a lack of bile is the issue. Yes, thanks, Abby. And also, I think um, to, to echo your point, I think one question is that, and many, many patients ask me this, why do I flare up with fish oils or primrose oil or hemp seed oil? Why do I have a flare? A few reasons for that. Number one, you may be reactive to salicylates, which is high in the fish oils. If they contain lemon oil as a preservative, it's high in flaxseed oil and hemp seed oil. So number one is salicylates. Number two of why do I flare with oils could be that it's high in histamine. Fish oils are high in histamine, therefore that may be a reason for that. Um, and number three, it could be that your gut microbiome is high in this bacteria called is called desulfovibrio, and it feeds on um, it's a bowel bowel eating bacteria, and therefore the more fats you give it, the more it proliferates. So, yeah. oh, I was just gonna add that that's why some people feel better on a low fat diet, or some people who have tried the medical medium diet where it suggests no to low fat feel really good on it because there's no fats at all. Um, but we do need the fat for um, for hormones, for our skin, for um, our whole body. Yes. And so um, in summary, um, fats are great. However, always address your bowel first, such that your fats can be used efficiently. If not, you get expensive poo. <laughs> I like the way you put it.
I I once um, heard someone share before um, that their face was full of uh, eczema on the face. And once they actually removed uh, coconut oil, which is what they were ingesting, their face actually cleared up. Um, but the answer is not to avoid the fats forever, but it's to address the actual issue um, of the lack of bile, which is what Ben was sharing about before. Yeah. Thanks, Abby. And so maybe if it's okay, I'll move on to the next pathway, which is the kidneys and the pee. Um, let's discuss the pee and the kidneys here. So water intake is the most obvious reason. Um, however, I find that in today's day and age, we're all busy, we are, we are stressed with work, stressed with our personal lives, stressed with kids, and therefore, it's quite easy to forget to, to drink water. Um, however, besides water intake, um, what I often find is that also um, adding some electrolytes in water is very helpful because um, having some a pinch of salt or some... Um, those mixers of like some sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, it helps to then align the what we call the osmolarity of the blood and the cells, which means that having this similar um, osmolarity makes the water enter your cells easily and makes it intracellular water. And i.e., your cells can absorb the water. So um, next reason is electrolytes. So Ben, uh, a lot of clients that we see, I find that one issue they have is that they feel like they're drinking a lot of water, but they're still feeling very dehydrated and their skin is dry. So can you speak to this more? Yes. So um, dry skin, there are many reasons for that. So insufficient water, insufficient electrolytes, insufficient omega-3, EPA, DHA, insufficient omega-6, GLA, gamma lunonic acid insufficient bowel, inflammation. So in Chinese medicine, when there's excess inflammation, the heat burns up the fluids. The heat burns up your yin fluids and therefore you get dry. So sometimes in, in some clients, I find that despite having the best oils, the best fish oils, primrose oils, bowel support, if they're still dry, it's inflammation. And if we resolve the inflammation by helping the detox pathways, um, reducing the dysbiotic bacteria, the skin clears up and becomes moist. So it's not always about fats or bowel, but it's also about inflammation. That's great, Ben. So out of, um, I know you've seen many clients before with eczema and topical steroid withdrawal. So out of all of them, how many do you find that have issues with their kidneys? Yeah, so um, water intake, to give a number, I think around 30%. And um, I think that it almost becomes like a subconscious thing that we don't realize that we're having insufficient water. So I tell my clients that, you know, to, to buy two one liter bottles and then just have two a day as a measurement. Um, yeah. Thank you, that's helpful. So um, besides the water and the electrolytes for the kidneys, um, I love to use herbal medicine for the kidneys also, so it helps. Um, and there are, so you recall just now I talked about her herbal depuratives or herbal alteratives. They alter the nature of your blood. And let me just write this down. So, so you have alteratives here. And alteratives, you have different herbs open different pathways or open different parts of your river. Some herbs are kidney alteratives, some herbs are liver alteratives, some are blood alteratives, and some are general alteratives, and some are lymphatic alteratives. So the kidney alteratives that you have, my favorite kidney herb is nettles, nettle leaf. All right, it's now here for you, nettle leaf. So nettles does a few things. Um, nettles is a diuretic. It promotes urine flow, and therefore it flushes out bacteria in the urinary tract. That's number one. And nettles also is a cellular cleanser. And number three, nettles is an antihistamine. Nettles actually blocks what we call the H1 receptor in the body. And the H1 receptor can actually cause mast cell degranulation and release histamine. So um, just nettle tea a day, one, one cup a day can make a big difference in many of my clients' eczema. 
Would you recommend this for everyone to take or only some people, depending on what symptoms they have? Yeah, good question. So again, just to caveat that these are not um, prescriptive and these are neither they are neither are they recommendations, but they are just um, it's just sharing from what I see in my practice. So um, a few herbs that I find useful to support the kidneys, nettle leaf, dandelion leaves. We also have cleavers and these are all the kidney depuratives. So however, um, what we do in practice is that we assess the person's constitution. Herbs must be matched with the person. Are you hot? Are you cold? Are you dry? Are you damp? Are you, um, are you a more vata, pitta, kapha constitution in Ayurvedic medicine? And we match the herbs to you. Nettles is actually drying. And therefore, if you're too dry, I may not wish to dry you further by flushing up more water. So it depends on your constitution and we match the herbs to you. Oh, Abby, I think you're muted. Oh, thank you for letting me know. Later on, we'll go through some uh, testimonies of um, how uh, applying this can help your skin. So um, we'll go on to that later. But Ben, I'll let you continue. Sure. So I will just quickly run through so the other pathway. So we have the liver. Now, the liver pathway is the most important pathway that we can do. However, again, to say again, don't push the liver until you are peeing and pooing every day. Um, and you must pull at least once or twice a day before you push the liver. If not, there's a high risk, a high risk that you flare up. So um, let's discuss the liver now. The liver, you have two phases of pathways. Um, you have phase one and phase two pathways in the liver. Let's write this down for you. Phase one and phase two. <clears throat> um, almost everybody needs phase two support. So think of this like you have two trains. The, often when there's inflammation, the train behind is moving too fast and the train in front is moving too slow. And so helping phase two pathways is always more important than pushing phase one pathways. <clears throat> and let's discuss phase two pathways first. Phase two pathways, you need multiple nutrients. You need, let me write this down here. You need glycine, you need taurine, you need cysteine, methionine, and so on. So um, my favorite nutrient, or rather my favorite amino acid for phase two pathways is actually taurine. Um, taurine does a few things for me actually, or for my clients rather. Taurine supports phase two pathways. Taurine also supports, don't forget the bowel production. And so it kills two birds with one stone. Uh, taurine is also a very calming amino acid um, and you feel a sense of um, calm and well-being with taurine. So stress is a major part of eczema and taurine help in the, helps in the stress management aspect. So Ben, if someone is struggling with their liver, how would they know that the liver is where the issue is? What are some signs and symptoms that they should look out for? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so first and foremost, the patients will say, I react to everything. When I smell perfumes, I smell car fumes, I eat certain foods, I flare up. And this is a major sign that the liver, the liver's detox pathways are congested. So number one is, chemical sensitivities, food sensitivities, environmental sensitivities. And especially if you live in a house with mold, if there's a musky smell at home, if you see visible black mold in the toilets, you must support your liver, that's number one. And number two is that if you feel angry easily, so anger, irritability, in Chinese medicine, the liver is a seat of anger. So often when clients say that, oh, I feel so angry, I feel so irritable, um, of course, this is not just liver. I mean, just to acknowledge that anger can be because of many reasons. Trauma um, and also insufficient sleep. Eczema makes us angry. Eczema makes us irritable. It's natural. It's normal. But um, the liver can also be a main driver for anger. Um, so number two is anger. And number three, dry skin. Because the liver produces bowel and the gallbladder stores your bowel. And so... Often, if a liver is stressed and congested, it may not produce bowel efficiently, and therefore you can't emulsify fats, and therefore you get dry skin. So to summarize, anger, dry skin, and chemical sensitivities to everything. People will say, I react to everything. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I know a lot of people will um, 
uh, just to backtrack, I used to work at a health food store. So I would have people coming in the health food store saying that, you know, I heard that doing a liver cleanse is good. Um, you know, what kind of cleanse should I do? So based on this um, detox pathways that we're sharing, um, it might not be a good idea to just pick up a liver detox kit um, by yourself, um, especially if all the other parts are not um, running effectively, especially if, um, as Ben mentioned, um, the, bo the bottom parts of the detox pathway um, of the urine and bowel movements, kidneys, um, and the rest of the body are not effective uh, or are not working effectively at the moment. And, and Ben's going to go through the rest of the detox pathways as well. Sure. And to just wrap up the liver pathway section, um, the liver, you have multiple pathways to detoxify. It's not just liver. The liver phase two is not just phase two by itself, but you have a few pathways under phase two. You have amino acid conjugation, you have glutathione conjugation, you have methylation, you have sulfation, and so on. So you have acetylation. So for each pathway, you need different things. Um, and therefore, in naturopathic practice, I do a few things. I may run a test for genetic mutations to see which pathway is clogged. Um, or also, some of the bloods, if you have high bilirubin, we suspect whether you have like Gilbert syndrome or not, and therefore your, your pathways may be congested. So therefore, um, liver pathways is not just a blanket one pathway, but there are many pathways under liver support. For example, if you are an undermethylator, um, or if you have a mutation in your CBS gene or your MTF MTHFR gene, we assess whether uh, whether a B-complex is suitable for you. And a B-complex is not just a B-complex alone, but rather do we use methylcobalamin, methyl B12, do we use adenosyl B12 or hydroxy B12? Therefore, there is a lot of customization and personalization to address your specific liver path where it's congested. Again, methylation, sulfation, Glutathione conjugation, amino acid conjugation, acetylation, and so on. Therefore, um, we will customize this for your specific part of the river that is congested. I think you put it really well, Ben. And it just goes to show how much we customize everything, especially if um, I know that uh, I've heard from many people who uh, will see a practitioner or a naturopath um, or a nutritionist, and what they'll be given is a basic supplement plan, um, usually consisting of things like omega-3, quercetin, zinc, vitamin D, um, uh, probiotics. So those are very common ones I hear about a lot. But because we go so in-depth to actually look at your whole history and see where the detox pathway is clogged and then customize something for you, I think that it really makes um, a world of a difference for clients who are going through uh, congestion. Thanks, Abby. And um, I just saw the comments. This is um, Isa. You asked about what's your protocol to fight staph aureus overgrowth and your son keeps on having staph. So let me just address this before I move on to the, um, the other parts of the river. So um, for staph, my protocol is inside out, outside in. We must address it from two sides. And um, when patients see me, they have been on many rounds of antibiotics already to fight staph and it gets better for a while, it comes back and they are on antibiotics again and it's a recurrent thing. Um, so antibiotics have a time and place for sure and it's important. Um, my protocol is outside in. I may use things like colloidal silver sprays. I may use herbal, um, customized herbal creams to kill staph aureus. Um, and there are many herbs that have actually been shown to have a strong anti-staph activity, even against MRSA. We have golden seal, we have nigella sativa, black cumin seeds, we have organ grape, we have coptus chinensis, we have um, tuya and so on. So there are many herbs for that. And therefore, one, I love to customize creams for my patients and I, I make the dose right, I make the base right, I make the combinations right and therefore we get good success with that. Um, number two, let's, I'll do an inside out approach. What I mean is that I will use herbs to support the immune system because if your immunity is down, your body just can't fight staph aureus efficiently. My favorite herbs may be echinacea, ashragalus, however, Please be very careful with these immune herbs because 
in some people, they're going to flare up. And these herbs may push an already hypervigilant immune system into even more vigilance. Therefore, be careful. And for me, I adjust a dose, the, the quantities, the proportions right for my clients to ensure that it doesn't flare, flare them up. Um, number three, I also love to use vitamin D to support staph. Vitamin D on the skin and internally increases what you call antimicrobial peptides. It helps your skin's own cutaneous immunity to fight against staph or risk overgrowth. These are my three broad approaches. Number one, inside out, outside in, and also improving the skin's own cutaneous immunity. Thank you for sharing that. And um, we actually use these approaches for my baby as well because um, Ben had seen photos of my baby and um, how bad his skin was. Uh, it was red everywhere. And um, so we had actually gone this route and um, the it, it really helped to reduce the staff. And we still use the customized herbal creams for it. And um, yeah, we've, we've seen results. Um, and, and I just want to add as well that if you are interested in learning more about um, how our Eczema Conquerors program can help you, um, you're definitely welcome to book a call with us, um, a breakthrough call. Um, the link should be in the description, or you can um, head to my website, eczemaconquerors.com, and um, you'll be able to find the, the link for the breakthrough call there. But um, I'll, I'll let you continue to um, share more. Uh, we had... Sure. Um, is that who said amazing? Thank you so much. So um, thank you for, for answering her question. Thanks, Isa. And Isa, I just have found two more points um, to just add on. So um, number four is that for recurrent staph infections, um, I also assess the environment. What I mean is that um, wash the towels in hot water and in a dryer, um, and also the bed sheets, the, the mattresses have to be sun because often um, the staff areas can also then transmit through the, the fabric. So um, yeah, wash in hot water above um, 60 degrees Celsius. Um, and number five is that um, I do use home homeopathic sometimes and homeopathy, I do find that in some people using a um, Staph aureus no soap can be useful. So we give a Staph aureus 30C or 6C and this helps the, your own immune system to actually fight against Staph aureus more efficiently. So um, in summary, we look at the environment, your mattresses, the pillows, the towels. We look at your immune system, vitamin D, immune system herbs, homeopathy. We look at the skin, um, topical creams like golden seal, myrrh, um, andrographis, nigella, and we customize the herbs for you. We find a correct herb for your skin. So I hope that answers your question. And thanks, Isa, for your, this great question. And also, and um, you'll see a few polls on staff overgrowth. Thanks so much, Ben, for sharing that. Yeah, no, I'll let you. I'll let you continue. So, um, actually, going back to the river, uh, how we shared about the detox pathways. Um, do you? Um, I know we talked with a client yesterday. Um, he he was uh, one thing we were trying to do was help his bowel movements. Um, so in terms of helping with the staff, just reducing the toxic load and reducing the burden on the body, um, how helpful do you find uh, coffee enemas or even colonics in the in that process? Yeah, good question. So coffee enemas actually increase levels of glutathione in the liver, which is a master antioxidant. Um, I, I'm all for helping detox pathways using enemas or colonics, but um, I find that my first principle is how can I help the body to do it itself as opposed to doing enemas, which is useful, but it can be quite inconvenient and quite uncomfortable. Um, and I speak from experience. Uh, so yeah, I, for... I, I agree. Um, we, we, uh, uh, there are exceptions sometimes. For example, our client yesterday had been doing it uh, every three every three months for three years. So in that case, we mentioned that it, it can be quite a lot over time and it can wipe out the good bacteria. So we actually um, suggested taking a break for a while. But um, yeah, as a temporary solution, um, it can help lower the burden. But as you mentioned, we, we still want to get to the root cause. For sure. So yes, I think that if my client is very constipated, um, I'm all for colonics because it gets the stools out quickly. Um, but the colonics also remember that they don't target 
they target the last part of the small intestine, the descending colon, but they don't go all the way up to the ascending and the transverse colon. And therefore we have to push it from two directions, from up and from down, from downwards. Therefore, going back to the fiber, the bowel, addressing SIBO, addressing stress, water intake is critical. Thank you for sharing. I'll let you continue uh, sharing the detox pathways. Sure. So um, let me move on to the lymphatics now. Um, so the lymphatic system, how do I tell that your lymph nodes are clogged? Um, for clients who see me in person, I'll palpate the lymph nodes. We have lymph nodes all over our, below our jaw um, and at the back of our, our jaw. So I'll palpate those areas and at the sides of our neck here. So these are your cervical lymph nodes. And therefore, when you palpate them, you can feel them a bit harder, like, like small marbles. And so this is one major sign of a congested lymphatic system. Number two, eczema on the neck. So in many clients, the eczema extends across the whole neck and it stops along the face here. That's number two. Number three, eczema in the inguinal area. So on the um, in the groin area along the, the that the part of in the inner thighs, that's one sign that the eczema is also lymphatic um, induced because there are major lymph nodes on those areas also. Um, and number four is that um, a whole flushing reaction on the collarbone area and the shoulders because um, the lymph nodes, the major lymphatic um, drainage is in the collarbone area. Um, the whole body drains into the two lymph nodes on the collarbone area here. Therefore, um, these are the signs that the, your lymph nodes, your lymphatic system needs support. Uh, number five, armpits. So the um, under the armpits is a major sign that the lymph nodes, the lymph nodes need support also. Um, now, however, remember, don't push the lymphatic system until your lower parts of the river are flowing. If not, you cause a jam on top. Um, my... Favorite, favorite, favorite herb for lymphatic support is cleavers. So herbs have a spectrum and a hierarchy also. And don't push the strong herbal lymphatics until you go with the weaker ones first. What I mean is that some clients come to me and they say, oh, I tried burdock, I had a major flare up. I tried poke root, I tried blue flag and I flared up. Um, because the leafy herbs are always more gentle than the root herbs. So prioritize leaves first before roots. So my favorite help is cleavers. I love cleavers for lymphatics. So cleavers is gentle. It opens up the lymphatics, also opens up the kidneys at the same time. Um, and after that, I move on to the stronger lymphatic herbs, but I go slow, go slow with lymphatics. Cleavers, organ gray, blue flag, burdock, poke root. This is my broad spectrum in that order. I love that. Thank you for sharing. And just for some background, I've I've struggled with uh, swollen lymph nodes for for many years. Um, ever since I was a teenager, um, I would get uh, the lymph nodes, especially in my upper thigh area. Um, and I remember my doctor would would check it, and he would do the ultrasound just to make sure. And um, yeah, it was uh, he suspected it was because of the flares, and so we monitored it every six months. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's frustrating because a lot of uh, uh, people that we see also experience it and it can be tough. Um, and just for some background, the lymphatic system is an important part of your immune system because it, it mainly moves through movement. And um, a lot of times, not all of us walk or exercise um, every day, especially if we're sitting at our desk a lot, or if we're in pain from our skin. So that's why it can be helpful to get your lymphatic system moving. Yes. And to build on Abby's point, um, in naturopathic medicine, we don't just do herbs, but we do lifestyle, we do diet and nutrition. So um, castor oil is great for helping the lymphatic system and also um, walking or rebounding or even hot, cold, contrasting showers. However, um, I'm not a fan of hot cold showers because when we have flare-ups, the, the last thing we want is to have a shower because it's so painful. So um, yeah, 
Mm -hmm. oh. And dry brushing. Yeah, dry brushing can help as well. Although if you have a lot of wounds, um, it's very tough to dry brush. Um, so a dry brush is when you take a brush and you just, uh, they have special brushes for it and you can brush your whole entire um, body and skin towards your heart. Um, but I wasn't a fan of it just because when I was 90% covered in wounds, I didn't want to just uh, make make myself feel even more uncomfortable with it. Yes. Um, and myself included, you know, like um, just five or six years back, my whole face was flaking all red and um, and people couldn't recognize me and um, I would feel so ugly and so self-conscious. And um, for me, one major part was that when I opened up my detox pathways, um, my skin improved a lot. And number two is um, stress management. Um, I digress a bit, but I find that many of my clients with eczema and myself included, um, the top stressor is perfectionism uh, i see this in almost everybody with constant chronic eczema and it's almost a very neurogenic a very adrenal and nervous system driven eczema but yeah perfectionism is a major thing i see among almost everybody with um adults with um severe chronic eczema Thanks for sharing. Yeah, I noticed that too. I am also a perfectionist, so I can definitely relate to that. And um, going back to the lymphatic system, um, another thing that you can try is a lymphatic drainage massage. Um, so you can go see someone for that, a, a massage therapist specifically, or you can even do self lymphatic drainage massages that you can find on YouTube. So those are free. Um, we actually have a massage therapist as a client um, in our program. And so for our group coaching calls, she would, she's done some, uh, teach, she's actually done some teachings where she's taught uh, self lymphatic drainage massage. So it's been very nice. Um, but if you are going to see someone for it, um, one, one of the techniques that I've heard is really, really good is the Dr. Botters uh, technique. So I believe they have a directory if you search online for the Dr. Botter's uh, lymphatic drainage massage. Um, th it'll show some in your area. Um, but it, lymphatic drainage massages feel very strange at first because um, they basically just go like that along your, um, you, they, uh, with your, they use your hand to go, move along your entire body, but like a feathery, very light uh, movement. So it feels very tickly. It does, it does. I, I tried it a few times and I felt so ticklish and yes. Yeah, I, I don't love it. I, I prefer a regular massage, but I know the benefits are very great. Yeah, and the last thing I do for lymphatics is that for very sensitive clients, um, what I do is um, I actually use homeopathic, so the drainage remedies. The undas or the Dr. Rekovic drops, unda one, unda two, um, it's a good start to move the imang trees or the detox pathways. Um, yeah, and I think I'll move on to the last part of the river, which is the first part of the river. Um, so the gut. Um, now, why, though I write the gut here and there's a gut here, again, the pool and the bowels, but this is different. Um, what I mean is that <clears throat> the, the way the toxins flow is that the gut, what I call the LPS, the lipopolysaccharides from the bacteria, the bacteria in the gut produce toxins, endotoxins, which is called LPS. These LPS enter the liver and then enter the bloodstream or enter the bowels and the kidneys. So if you do a GI map um, or an oats test, organic acids test, and you find that there's this biosis, until you, you kill off the bad bacteria, you're always poisoning the downstream river consistently. So one thing I find, which is a game changer for myself, I've done it a few times for myself also, is doing a GI map. It helps me to tell whether is there leaky gut? Because if there's high zonulin, there's high leaky gut. Is there gut inflammation? And I have, in one of my clients, um, he had, his eczema just couldn't shift for like months. He saw TCMs, he saw homeopaths, he saw GPs, he saw me. And until we ran a gut test, and I, f I found high calprotectin, which is a marker for inflammatory bowel disease, maybe Crohn's, maybe colitis. So I, Asked him to check with the GP further to do a scope. But at the same time, I did for him some herbs and nutrients to calm down the gut inflammation. And, th and that was the skin's turning point. The skin improved from then on. So um, other markers I commonly see 
which indicates this biosis could be um, candida overgrowth, could be bacteria. We find Klebsiella, which is Klebsiella is a major histamine producer. Let me write this down for you, Klebsiella. So in the gut test, the GI map, I often find high Klebsiella. And high Klebsiella, it's also a major autoimmune trigger. It also is a major high, it's a high histamine producer also. Um, high Klebsiella, we have Candida. My screen's up here, let me just adjust it. Candida, Klebsiella. We also have Morganella um, and so on. Um, leaky gut, Zonulin, and also IBD, Calprotectin. Calprotectin. So, um, in summary, the GNAP tells us which is the issue and therefore it saves you money in the long term. And my treatments are very different for each of these conditions. Um, to share further, if you're high in Klebsiella, there are some herbs like um, hibiscus and uh, neem that are Klebsiella specific. If it's high candida, different herbs. Hibiscus and neem wouldn't cut it. We look at paudiaco, horopito, aniseed, and so on. Again, please don't self-prescribe because um, we'll match the herbal energetics and the herbs to you. But of course, if you wish to try it, um, and if you um, have read it somewhere else, or, or if, if your, your natural, natural path prescribe it, um, then of course you can consider, but um, don't self-prescribe unless um, professionally recommended. Um, so I just want to also give some background on the GI map. Um, we do run that for a lot of our clients um, in case you're interested in learning more about it. However, sometimes the price for um, adding in these functional tests can be um, expensive and out of reach for some people. Uh, just to give some background, depending where you live, um, I've seen some range from anywhere from like three to six, seven hundred dollars US, um, but also uh, depends if you're very international because of the shipping costs. So it really ranges a lot. So Ben, um, in the case that some people can't afford a GI map, um, I know that there are other alternatives too. So would you be able to share some of those? Like if, if clients really can't afford the GI map? Yes, yeah, so for sure. I think that it's, a, it's expensive and I find it expensive also, but um, I find that in cases where, um, where cost is an issue, I will ask some questions to assess what may, what may be the, 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 the triggers, for example, Let's take Klebsiella, for example. Klebsiella loves to eat starches. So I'll ask my clients, do you have a high starch diet? Do you love to eat rice or noodles or carbs or potatoes? And if it's a yes, I may assess whether for Klebsiella be an issue. And also some clients have what I call ankylosing spondylitis, AS. Ankylosing, ankylosing, spondylitis, spondylitis, or A, or AS. And this is often a Klebsiella triggered condition, which is like if you have pains in your joints, in your spine, and so on. Um, candida, do you have thrush? Is your tongue, does your tongue have a thick white coating? Um, do you have like vaginal thrush? Do you feel itchy on, on, on the private areas? Um, do you flare up if you eat sugary foods? Do you, um, if you eat honey, do you flare up? So um, that's one sign of candida. Um, do you have many food reactions, chemical sensitivities? Um, and also for Morganella, um, if you eat high histamine foods, if you eat avocados, broccoli, fermented foods, you flare up. Diggy gut. Diggy gut, if you have done an IgG, food intolerance test, are you high in almost everything? Um, do you flare up after eating foods after a few hours or one or two days? That's a major sign, of, a major leaky gut sign. Um, IBD, do you have mucus in your stools? Do you have like painful diarrhea? Do you have, do you see these like, like transparent sticky gel-like fluid in your stools, which are some signs of IBD? Again, these are not diagnostic and it needs further tests, but these are some very preliminary signs that we ask our patients about. And therefore we treat based on these. Um, so for example, if you have leaky gut, do we, do we use glutamine? However, we, we will assess a whole person because if you are anxious, glutamine becomes glutamate and therefore you may trigger some neuro excitation. Um, 
do we use, let's say, prebiotics? Which one do we use? We have GOS, we have FOS, we have inulin, we have PHGG, partially hydrogenized guar gum. So we, we match the prebiotics to you. If you have SIBO, we avoid prebiotics at the start because it can feed your bad bacteria. Um, IBD, do we use zinc, hanosin, do we use aloe vera, do we use um, okra, do we use um, glutamine again? So we can, I just wish to at this stage share that there's a lot of intricacies involved in assessing the supplements for each person. And it is not that, oh, I've leaky gut, what do I take? It's not so simple because do you have anxiety? Do you have SIBO? Do you have um, any allergies to, to chamomile? which is also helpful for, for gut issues. Therefore, we match the supplements to the person and we customize it to the person. Thank you so much for sharing. And yeah, I really appreciate that. Um, we have uh, been running, um, been able to work with this for a lot of our clients. I would also love to share more, to talk quickly about some of the patterns that we see a lot too. For example, I always see, uh, I. Pretty much lately, I'm always seeing uh, Staph aureus and Streptococcus as high on this GI map. So I would love um, if you could speak to this pattern. Yeah. So I wish you first caveat that um, Strep and Staph being high in a GI map doesn't mean that it's high in the skin. So um, skin, staff and, skin staff and gut staff can be quite different. So skin staff, what I see is the classic sign is a golden or yellow crust on the skin major sign because the word aureus, staph aureus, aureus means gold. So if you see a yellow cross on the skin, it signifies a staph aureus overgrowth. However, I do find that in my practice for any severe eczema case, I almost always kill staph because even in even without yellow cross, over 90% of us with eczema have staph aureus overgrowth. Staph just loves eczema skin for some reason and therefore killing staff is almost always a given. Now, the next question I get is then, and I think Isa, this will answer your questions also. Um, will I get resistant to staff or risk or not? Um, I haven't seen this in practice using herbs, therefore the short answer is I don't think so, but I always rotate my herbs because by changing herbs up every two or three months, I avoid the staff becoming used to the, the same herbs. Now to answer Abby's question, so. Um, if I see high staph and high strep in the gut, um, sometimes it it does, I do see benefits in using some gentle antimicrobials to reduce the, the load. Because if we reduce the bad bacteria populations, it gives us more space for the, for the good bacteria to grow in the place. It's like a forest. You have a plot of land and like, let's say like, you know, like X by X meters. If you reduce the bad bacteria, you give more space for the good guys to flourish, for your plants to grow. So um, my favorite approach is actually not killing. I find that we are killing too much. Um, many of my clients come to see me with like having many rounds of like antibacterials, antibiotics, herbals, or, or pharmaceuticals, and they use even strong ones like oregano oil. And I find that we are killing too much. Um, even, even uh, yeah, recently we, we were working with a client where she had worked with a lot of um, some, uh, sorry, he had worked with some top uh, practitioners in the eczema field. And there was definitely a lot of killing as well in antimicrobials. Yeah. Um, my top two favorite herbs to support dysbiosis, excess bad bacteria, excess candida. And these herbs also feed good bacteria at the same time. So we can have our cake and eat it. We can kill two birds with one stone. Top two herbs, pomegranate, husk, and green tea. I love these two herbs. And um, um, no, this is a husk, not the fruit. So don't eat the, uh, uh, don't, don't go eating the fruit so quickly, but it's a husk. Um, and in herbal pharmacology, the tannins in the pomegranate husk are so useful. They, they feed, they kill the bacteria. At the same time, the polyphenols in pomegranate husk feed the good bacteria. So you, it's excellent herb, pomegranate husk, I love it. Uh, number two, green tea. Green tea is again, both a prebiotic and also an antimicrobial, and it's a selective antimicrobial. And I love these two herbs because um, they don't wipe out the good bacteria. They are not a nuclear bomb. They, are, they feed and a weed at the same time. Do you find that matcha is just as effective? 
Uh, yes, and this brings us to our, our point about having customization because uh, Marsha being high in caffeine can just cause neural excitation. Therefore, we customize the dose and the herbs of the patient. So um, uh, the short answer is yes, but if you feel anxious easily, be careful of Marsha because you may, the caffeine may be quite stimulating. Have you heard of green tea ever um, causing unwanted effects on the skin as well because of the caffeine too, even though it's in smaller amounts than matcha? The caffeine, yes, and also green tea can actually inhibit the Dao enzyme. And the Dao enzyme, diamine oxidase, DAO, the Dao enzyme is, helps to metabolize our exogenous histamine from foods. And therefore, having if you already have a histamine intolerance and you have green tea liberally, you may be further impairing your histamine pathways. Um, one interesting thing is that I know we get a lot of questions about, you know, what what can I do? What supplements can I take in the meantime while I'm helping to help my flare go down? And we've talked before um, offline about how it's very difficult to customize something, especially how, um, you know, omega threes can be helpful. Um, hemp oil can be helpful, but they also have a potential to cause flares if someone is, uh, if their bile is um, stagnant and there's not enough. So it's uh, interesting how there can also be the opposite effect. And that's also why customization is so important as well. For sure, for sure. And you know, um, I think that for myself, I, I see my job as, as um, building the big picture. As my clients speak, I see is there the nervous system part involved? Is there the gut? Is there the adrenals? Is there the is there dysbiosis? Is there candida? Is there stress? And we piece together all these puzzles and we see which do we address first. So it's a mind map. And we are all mind maps. We're all like all of us are complex creatures and we and in each person's case, I map different parts and I prioritize different parts of the puzzle. And we peel the, the top onion layer first before we go down to the deeper onion layers. Yeah, and also just to backtrack as well, is in some cases, um, some people want to work on everything at once, but it's, it's, um, it's a journey. It's like peeling layers of an onion and we work on the most important things first and then slowly we peel deeper and deeper into the deeper layers and then we work further. And so this is also why it's important to customize something for you. And so if you are um, interested as well in working with us, um, you can book a free breakthrough call uh, with someone on our team and we'll be happy to share more about some of the processes that we use and how we can help as well. Yes, for sure. Um, have I answered your question about the testing? Earlier, the strap yep. and the staff. Yeah, I think I answered them. Yes. And I'll let you continue as well if there's anything you want to share about the gut. Yeah. So I think that more or less this wraps up um, the whole detox pathway talk. Um, there are many more intricacies for sure, but I think it's the first cut. Um, also, this is quite a. Uh, in summary, um, the takeaway from today's talk is number one, ensure that your river is flowing at the bottom first before you push the rivers upstream pathways is number one. Number two is that there's unfortunately no one size fits all for each pathway because whether it's the gut, the lymphatics, the liver, the the, um, the kidneys and so on, there are multiple interventions for each and therefore we will match it to each person. Um, and number three is that I find in practice, even if all these pathways are moving, but if there's a constant stress response, if there's a constant cortisol dysregulation, the skin will not heal. Therefore, the stress management is so important, but that may be a talk for a different day. And we have, to give you a preview, um, we have this class of herbs called adaptogens, which I love to use in my herbal practice, adaptogens. And as the name suggests, adaptogens, they adapt your, your body to stress. And we have many, many of them around. We have rhodiola, we have Siberian ginseng, we have American ginseng, we have um, codonopsis, we have gynostema, and many, many of them. So therefore, but this will be, um, stay tuned and we'll discuss this in the next session. Um, Isa, you had another question about how can I help my son, my TSW son through the itchy nights? Um, let me address this for you. Um, my first priority when there is TSW is I address a night itch. Because if you can't sleep well, nothing else is going to work well. Um, so there are a few herbs that we can do for 
there are natural antihistamines. I love natto leaf, which is, which is a natural antihistamine. And some of the other herbs that I prescribe professionally as antihistamine herbs are Bicoscal cap, Perilla, Albizia, black cumin seeds. So there are many herbs available, but um, these herbs have different energetics. Some are hot and dry, some are cool and moist, some are cool and dry, therefore we'll match these herbs to you. And also for your son, based on his age, we'll check what's his age, what's his weight, and we'll compute the dose for the age and the weight. Because if we just dose it like that, we may overdose or we may underdose. So therefore we will match the dosing to, your, to each person. Um, so that's one, using antihistamine herbal medicines is one. Number two is that, um, don't forget that itching, the reason why we itch, each of our cells, the mast cells, have a fat bilayer. Every cell has a lipid bilayer. And therefore, giving each person fish oils, primos oils, and phospholipid supplements can help in helping to strengthen the cell membranes such that these cells don't open up and degranulate so easily. It's like these cells are these naughty people carrying plastic bags, carrying bags of like histamine, and they spill the histamine on, on the floor and you get itchy. So um, how do we then prevent these people from opening up the bag and spilling the bag out? So I strengthen the bag such that the histamine doesn't leak out so easily. Again, fish oils, primos oil, phosphatidylcholine, and so on. Again, not prescriptive, but these are some of the things we consider in clinic. Um, number three is that um, we often use creams also. Some creams on the skin can calm down the T cell activation and calm down the, the mast cell degranulation. So these are some broad ideas that we can consider. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I really appreciate it. And I know that um, uh, we, we all really appreciate all the information that you shared. Um, if anyone is interested in hearing other topics um, for us to dive into to help you on your journey, um, just let us know. We'll be happy to do more episodes like this. And we do have more coming up, especially diving into different herbs um, that can be antimicrobial, that can address dryness, different topical creams that we can use. and um, that Ben is also able to customize. So thank you so much, um, oh, everyone. Um, for should we discuss the, um, the the two cases just briefly or should we oh, go yeah, to the next yeah. session? Yeah, uh, we can do that as well. So I'm gonna bring it up on the screen. Um, there's- uh, Thanks, Isa. There's case study one and case study two as well. So let me allow you to share um, Case study one and two. Yeah. So I think um, this first case study actually illustrates the importance of um, having the imang trees or the river flowing. So this lady came to me and after around four or five months, she her body cleared up and now she's fully clear. So, um, so for those, sorry to interrupt Ben, for those who are listening and not able to see the photo, let me quickly describe it to you. So um, this person has uh, red marks um, all over the back, um, probably about 80 to 90 percent of the back with uh, red um, circles and red marks as well. And in the after photo, about 80 to 90 percent of it is clear and it has faded a lot. Yeah. So um, for this lady, she came to me with, yeah, as Eddie mentioned, almost full body discoid eczema. And um, she was itchy, she couldn't sleep. She was very um, stressed for sure. And our first step for her was to make sure that she was pooping well. So um, I recall for her case, um, we ran a gut microbiome test. She had dysbiosis. So we used what you call the selectively acting antimicrobial anti herbs that we discussed earlier. Um, and then, so these herbs feed her good bacteria, but they also kill the bad bacteria. That's number one. And number two, um, she was already having sufficient water, therefore that was fine. After around one or two months of helping the gut microbiome to be balanced, I moved to the liver. Um, liver support um, for her, I recall, I did, um, my favorite herb for liver is actually Shizandra, Shizandra berries. S-C-H-I-S-A-N-D-R-I, Shizandra. And Shizandra is a, is a top herb for building levels of glutathione in the liver. And glutathione is a master antioxidant of the liver. 
So therefore, I love she's interest as a tea, as a herbal liquid. But for her, because um, I was her practitioner, I gave her a dose that was therapeutic. I gave her a she's li liquid that matched her age, her gender, and her, con her constitution. Um, and that was number two. Each step along the way, we saw more and more clearance. After the liver, I moved on to the lymphatics. I gave her a lymphatic tea blend, and so I often blend teas that, that support her body constitution. Um, I recall I used some cleaver, some calendula, but again, please don't self-medicate because these are practitioner-grade liquids that we customize for the patients to make it specific for them. Um, and after we did these three steps, as I worked up her liver, uh, worked, worked up her river, her skin began clearing progressively. The, the icing on the cake, the last part to clear the skin was the adrenals or the stress management. And um, I supported her. So let me just, I'll draw this down. I'll draw this for you quickly. Um, how do I clear the screen? I thought I saw the clearing somewhere. Um, let me see. I think the screen is locked. Never mind. Um, I'll draw this on the same screen here anyway. Okay, um, I can. Uh, let's see if I can get a new one for you so that we it. can. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So for stress, the stress management, um, when we are stressed, our levels of cortisol shoots up and down like this. This is cortisol. Um, what herbs do, and it's called adaptogens, herbal adaptogens, what they do is they help to flatten the curve. And they make our bodies our body more resilient to the fluctuations in cortisol. So it's a bit flat like this. Like this. So um, instead of this constant fight or flight response, it's not here. I see it on my screen. But yours is blank. I mean, I'll just talk through it. So um I think there might also be a delay in um uh, but yeah, you're right. I can't seem to see it for some reason. Um mm. I think before there is a delay too. No problem. So, um, but to just wrap up the stress management, I, I gave her some nervines and some adaptogens, and these helps calm down the stress response. And then, yeah, um, my favorite nervines are things like passion flower. Um, I love to use lemon balm, chamomile, and um, I, I match these herbs with her constitution. So, um, with all these, that was the, the last part of the onion, and now she's fully clear. So, yeah. Um, I think that we have one more case study, but I think, um, shall we go through this or shall we leave it for the next session because I might have um, the time. Yeah, we can quickly go through it uh, so that okay. people can watch it. Yeah. So this case study was, is this 10-year-old um, girl. And when she saw me, um, she was having quite severe um, and weeping eczema on both of the armfuls. And um, after around a few months, uh, now it's, it's, you can see some scarring left on the right-hand side. Um, for her, so this, what I did for her was I did mainly immune support. And um, this will be a webinar for a different time. However, um, the flag came about, came about after COVID. So um, I commonly see many, many people having flare-ups after COVID infections and herbs are very useful in, in helping to calm down an overactive immune system. So for her, I did an immune system tea blend. I customized it for her. And within a few weeks, she was improving already. And now she's almost clear. Um, after immune support, I always wrap up the case by avoiding further relapses. And therefore, for this case, she's almost clear. And my, my approach for her to support remission is to support the skin barrier. So our skin is like a fortress and we must fortify the fortress to avoid further staph or risk going in and triggering further inflammation. So what I did was I did Gauchy Cola, collagen powder. These are my favorites. Um, and so I also gave her some oils to hydrate, to, for skin hydration and yep, and now she's stable. So um, in summary, some takeaway points are that no two cases are the same. And we always have a very, very deep question to ask to ask the patients when they start, what's the root cause, what makes it worse, what makes it better? And therefore we address the causes and we get good results.
That's amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, even um, we, I think uh, I had um, a two, two of our nutritionists on our team. We talked about how long does it take for the skin to heal. And we talked about how even if there's a mother and daughter, they can they will have different approaches as well, different protocols, and they won't necessarily be the same. So I really appreciate you for sharing and just being here to share, Ben. Um, and I know that we've talked for quite a long time. So um, thank you for tuning in today. We are going to continue and continue to do more podcast episodes to help you as well. Um, don't forget that if you do want more support, um, you can always book a complimentary breakthrough call with our team and we'll be here to support you. We can share um, what testing can be done. We can even help audit and, sh and let you know what might be missing as well. Um, but yeah, Ben is uh, one of the naturopaths on our team team. And um, he's been really wonderful in helping to help our clients um, and their skin to get better. So I really appreciate you for your time today. And um, just want to acknowledge um, all the great work that you're doing. And um, for anyone who's struggling, um, if you're interested in working with us, um, we, uh, we have been on our team who you can always work with as well. And so we hope that a lot of the information he shared was helpful today. And we hope that we can also continue to keep educating you and helping you on your journey as well. So thank you so much for watching. And I hope that all of you have a great day. Bye. Thanks, Abby. Thanks, everyone.